And all right, uh, tonight we're in Hebrews chapter number four. And the first thing that I want to say to you is this is basically, you know, uh, in a sense, part two of last Wednesday's service and sermon. Now, the reason I say that is because there is such a strong continuity with the topic of last week and this week. And a lot of the time was spent defending what the Bible actually teaches in regards to salvation and explaining, while doing that, I was explaining hard to, uh, you know, hard to understand verses. There's a couple of verses in Hebrews chapter number three that are a little bit difficult. Well, there are a couple of verses not near as difficult, but that are somewhat difficult in Hebrews chapter number four. Hebrews chapter number three, Hebrews chapter number four have a very strong, you know, thread that go through both of them. And really at the end of Hebrews chapter number four, we start to change gears again, kind of going back to Hebrews chapter one, Hebrews chapter two style of writing. Now, here in Hebrews chapter number 4, it literally picks up immediately with what we were talking about in Hebrews chapter 3. And that was why I read it. I don't know if you remember, but I read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, at the very end of last week's uh, sermon. Now look with me at verse number 1. The Bible says this, Let us therefore, so that's always very important to understand, the word therefore. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now quickly I want to give pretty much the same introduction except more concise and faster than I did last week and that is number one I want you to understand the audience that he's writing to and that is the Jews. He's writing with great skepticism. We, we ended in Hebrews chapter number three where he's basically giving an invitation of salvation to the Hebrews or to the Jews just in case any of them are not saved. So he's writing to the Jews as a whole. And his overall point is telling them to endure. Now, this is in layers. Number one, he's telling them to endure as a people, as the Jews, in, in the sense of having their identity with God. They were rejected as a physical nation. But they still at least have the opportunity as a people to be saved and to believe on Christ. And to still, they could still, even though they're Jews, they could still just as much be the people of God today, couldn't they? Well, he is encouraging them and admonishing them and exhorting them to believe on Christ before they lose that opportunity. Now, that's going to be a big, strong theme again in this passage is that you need to take this opportunity while it is here. While the invitation is being extended, you need to receive it or there's a chance that you won't have this opportunity again. Look at verse 1 one more time. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So it's saying while it's offered right now, let, let us take advantage of this, right? What, will, what can we do? What should we do if we neglect so great of salvation? So it's saying while we as a people have this opportunity, we better take advantage of it. Now notice there that he says, any of you should seem to come short of it. So he's again, he's, he's saying, there may be some of you, some of you that, is, that are a part of the nation of Israel, that are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that identify as a Hebrew, identify as a Jew, that are not saved. Now I'm going to prove that. Hebrews chapter number 4 ties everything in Hebrews chapter number 3 together perfectly. And I'm going to prove that that is the correct interpretation by Hebrews chapter number 4. Now we're going to read verse 1 and verse 2 together. I want you to look at verse 1. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us, notice the plurality again here too, I want to point that out, let us, left us, entering into his rest, and then he says, any of you should seem to come short of it, saying just in case there's any of you. He doesn't know, but he's just extending that just in case maybe some of you should seem to come short of it. And one thing before we go to verse 2 was, what was the requirement according to the end of chapter 3? It's very clear, and he actually explains it just in case you thought that it was by works. What does he explain that? Why weren't they able to enter in? Because of unbelief, exactly. He's real clear. So if they came short of it, what did they not do? That's important. Believe. They didn't have faith. So he's saying maybe there's some of you that didn't believe on Christ. Maybe there's some of you that don't have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch verse 2. It's super important. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. What does it mean unto us? The Jews. Go back to chapter number 2. Verse number, verse number 3. 
How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and what does that mean? To the Jews, because look at what the next statement, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Now I want you to notice that he's speaking to the Jews specifically, that they were the ones that heard this. Verse 2 again, for unto us was the gospel preached, saying unto us as in the Jews, the Hebrews, it was preached unto us, right? And then he says, as well as unto them. Now when it says, as well as unto them, it's referring to the children of Israel that were in the wilderness. Look at verse 16. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Now notice that how he divides them into groups. And I pointed this out at the end of the sermon last week. Some didn't believe and some did believe. That's why in verse 1 he makes the statement, any of you should seem to come short of it. Saying, it's the same exact way. We look at the Jews as a whole. We look at the Hebrews as a whole. I'm afraid that there's a possibility that maybe some of you don't believe and some of you do. Verse 2 he says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Speaking to the children of I about the children of Israel in the wilderness. Now you know what else this proves? That it's the one gospel, my friend. Amen. Unto us was the gospel preached as the gospel, definite article, as well as unto them. That's not two different gospels. That's saying that the same gospel that was preached to them is the same gospel that was preached to us by the Lord and by the disciples. So the Lord, and you know, you have some hyper-dispensationalists that will go so far as to say that when Jesus was on this earth, he preached one gospel, and then the disciples preached some other gospel. It tells you that the, the disciples confirmed what the Lord preached. Therefore, they were, he would, how could he confirm it? How could they confirm what the Lord preached if they're preaching something different? That makes no sense at all. So that tells you that the Lord, Jesus, when he preached the gospel, he was preaching the same gospel that the disciples preached. But not only that, you can tie in even those who receive the gospel in the wilderness. They received the exact same gospel. You know what gospel they received? The everlasting gospel. There's only one gospel. So it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Then it says this, But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now I want you to notice it says, Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Does it sound like they believed at all? No, it's saying that it fell on deaf ears that it was preached to them and they rejected it, right? They totally rejected it. It's not as if they heard it and then believed it. You know, you'll have people obviously that believe that you can lose your salvation or it's like an enduring type of faith or it's endurance of faith plus works, right? No, it says it didn't profit them. Maybe it helped them a little bit and they were saved for a little while. No, it didn't profit them. They were, they were never saved because if you were saved, you'd always be saved. doesn't even make sense by the definition of the word with the D on the end of it. So notice that it did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So also, you can prove that, number one, it's the same gospel. We saw that already, same message and everything. And it's the same requirement for that same message. And what is it? Faith is required with that message. So the word is the gospel. And what do you need? You need faith. Faith is what gives you access. You hear the word first. And then you have faith. I want you to go to Romans chapter number 10. We'll go to Romans 10. Romans chapter number 10. And of course we're going to be coming back to Hebrews. Romans 10. And we see this. This order of events of how a person gets saved. It's actually told to us backwards. Go to verse number 13, Hebrews 10, 13. It says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher... And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? And then it says in verse number 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word 
of God. Now I want you to notice there it says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God, go back to Hebrews chapter number 4, is required for salvation. Amen. We believe that strongly at this church. That the Word of God is necessary. If anyone is going to go out soul winning on behalf of Valiant Baptist Church... They are going to preach the Word of God. You're not going to give cute illustrations. You're not going to just use your own words and paraphrase the Bible. If you're going to go out and say, Hey, I'm from Valiant Baptist Church, it is required that you use the Word of God. Because You know why? Because you're not, it's, 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 it's in vain. You're going soul winning in vain. And we don't want someone going out there you know, on behalf of Valiant Baptist Church and just doing vanity. You know, using our name and our church and, and, and uh, you know, confusing people with their own words. If you're going to go out soul winning on behalf of Valiant Baptist Church, we want it to be productive. We want people to be saved. We want it to, you know, bring people to Christ. And the only way you're going to do that is with the Word of God. It has to be faith mixed with the Word. That's what it has to be. Just like Hebrews chapter number 4 tells us here. You have to hear the Word of God. And then put faith in the Word of God. Without ever hearing the Word of God, you cannot be saved. If you have never heard the Word of God, that may help you to understand it, you cannot be saved. It, you know, a, a person's salvation, it, it necessitates to hear the Word of God. You must. It is necessary to hear the Word of God in order to be saved. Look at what it says in verse number 3. Watch verse number 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Now this is super powerful. Now notice how he words that. It's still plural, isn't it? But notice, like I said, in verses number 1 and 2, his skepticism about people maybe within that same group that haven't believed. So again, he's speaking to all the Jews, all the Hebrews. And he's saying, he's comparing the Jews of that generation and the Hebrews of that generation to the Jews uh, that were in the, uh, um, you know, the wilderness, the children of Israel in the wilderness. And he's saying, just like amongst the children of Israel then, there were those that did believe and didn't believe, I am scared or I am worried that there are some amongst you now that do believe and don't believe. That's again why he says in verse, chapter 4 verse 1, any of you should seem to come short of it. How would they come short of it? By not having faith. Verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them, in them that heard it. So notice how he refers to that group that were the children of Israel in the wilderness, and he says that there were a specific uh, you know, faction of that group that did not believe and it did not profit them. But there was also a faction that did believe and it did profit them, right? Well, now I want you to look at verse number 3 with that in mind. For we which have believed do enter into rest. So now he's talking about those that were Hebrews or those that were Jews that did believe. And that did at the time. Of course, Paul, the one writing the letter, he does believe. He has believed. And also I want you to notice this. It's past tense. It's not saying we which do believe. Right? We which are enduring in the faith. No, he says, we which have believed. Past tense. Because salvation is what? Instantaneous. Amen. It happens in a moment. It's not a process. Salvation is instantaneous. Salvation is immediate. And once you are saved, you are always saved. Amen. That's why it says this again. For we which have believed do enter into rest. The person that believes... They do enter into rest. At that moment, they are resting. They're resting in Christ. They put their faith in Christ, and at that moment, they're resting. They do enter into rest. Look at what it says afterwards. Do enter into rest. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now that's a quote, I believe it's Psalm uh, chapter 94, if you look it up. And it's talking about the children of Israel and the provocation uh, in the wilderness with the children of Israel. So that's why he quoted that, that right then at that time. I want you to look at verse number 4. 
It says, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. So this is a totally unrelated statement. Uh, it's not about the children of Israel as far as being in the wilderness now. This is just another example, It's ba basically, is what he's doing. He's giving you another example of something similar here. And he's going to explain further. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise... And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now, of course, that's in Genesis. That is at the creation. That's talking about when God created the world in six literal days. And then what did he do on the seventh day? He rested, right? This is a quote from the book of Genesis. That's what we see going on in the creation story. And he rests on the seventh day. And at that time, what did he implement? He instituted the Sabbath day, what we know as the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day was the seventh day of the week, right? It was the seventh day of the week. And what the children of Israel would do was they would labor for six days. They would work for six days and then they would rest upon the seventh day. And God, when he created all the world, you know, he did it in six literal days and he did that work in those six days. He spoke the world into existence and then he rested on the seventh day, not because he was tired or because he was weary, but to set an example for the Sabbath day. Now, this is very important and in the Old Testament, you know, they, you know, they wouldn't have understood this. <clears throat> Of course, not nearly as clearly as we do today, but it was meant to be a picture of Christ and that God was going to do all the work for us and that we would rest in Him and that we would rest on that seventh day. Now, I want you, I'm going to get more into that in the very next verse. Look at verse number 5. It says this, And in this place again, it makes this statement, If they shall enter into, now I want you to notice, my rest. Now, I want you to notice how he words that. It's my rest. It says, if they shall enter into my rest. Now, you know, any, you know, everyone that just works constantly knows how difficult labor can be. You know, men, women, you know, working constantly. You know, I am, I am, you know, extremely stressed out. The past four weeks, I cannot wait. I've never, like, looked forward to a vacation, I don't think, as much as I am right now. I'm mentioning, like, every three days. I feel like the biggest baby in the world. But I'm getting up super, super early. And I'm just working, you know, like, like 60 hours every week. I'm, I'm getting hardly any sleep. And when you work like that, you really appreciate the rest. You really look forward to when you're going to have some time off. When you're, when you, especially, you know, let's say like in that case, let's say you have some days where you're just working continually on a big project. You're spending tons of time. It's hard manual labor. In your mind, mentally, you can make yourself feel better just by looking forward to that rest. And when God instituted the Sabbath day for the children of Israel, they labored. And that's hard manual labor a lot of the time for those six days. You know, out there plowing a field, building fences, building a barn, you know, uh, uh, you know, dealing with animals, all different types of it. I mean, it's hard labor continually. You know, sun up, sun down all week, right? And of course, you know, women having to deal with children all day, it's extremely difficult. I could definitely not do it. You know, I'm there and they're driving me crazy after a few hours. I love my kids, but you know how that is. Um, but, you know, everybody, our jobs are difficult. It's extremely difficult. And we look forward to that rest. We look forward to that time when we can get a break from all of our labors. Well, God instituted that, that day to be a day of rest. And it's a day of enjoyment. You know, you enjoy and you look forward to that time off. You have in the Old Testament, you have God instituting the, you know, the Sabbath day as a law. And when he did so, he gave a lot of other laws. He gave a lot of, you know, ceremonial laws. But he gave, you know, the Old Testament law when he gave the covenant. And there were a massive amount of laws. And, I mean, it would be, to, 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 to have to step back in time and to be an Old Testament Jew, it would be extremely difficult to just constantly keep all of the laws that were in place. You know, it would be very difficult to keep all of the ceremonial laws, you know, just every day, you know, uh, you know, not, not the Sabbath. I mean, the Sabbath is a pretty basic law to keep, but there were, there were many, many different laws, you know, when they add them all up. It was a very laborious task. It was very hard, right? And so many people, when you look out in the world, so many people are, are, are under that old covenant still, aren't they? 
where they're trying to keep all of the, the works of the law, aren't they? Where they're just, they're just laboring. You know where they're at? They're in those six days. And they're just laboring. And there's some sincere, you know, uh, obviously there's none good, no, not one. But from our you know, perspective, what we would say, that guy seems like a good guy. Some sin sincere, honest people that maybe just haven't heard the true gospel yet. And they're out there, and you know what they're doing? They're, 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 they're honestly just laboring those six days. And they're working as hard as they can. You know what they're trying to work for? They're trying to work for that rest. They're trying to work so that they can enter into that rest. And what is that rest? Heaven. Crossing over Jordan. And they're striving so hard to get into it. But the, what they don't realize is that you don't do any of the work. God does all the work. God does every bit of the work. And creation was meant to be a picture of salvation. You know what it was? God did all of the work in those six days. He did every single bit of it. All of the work. Every bit of it. And you know what He did? He rested. And you know what He allows us to do? Not to do. We obviously take part in none of the work. And then we get to enter into His rest. His rest that He instituted on that seventh day. I believe I know where this, this is. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 10. I think I know where this is. Somebody might have to engage that Bible app if I'm wrong. Eleven. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 11. Look at verse number 28. That's what Jesus says. Matthew chapter number 11, verse number 28. Jesus says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Laden is like burden. You have a lot on your shoulders. And he says this, And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And then he says, For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So notice what Jesus says. He gives the invitation here. And of course, this is an invitation of salvation. And you know what? You can sometimes get burdened down like in life, and we can relate this verse to that. But you know what another really good application is to it? To all those that are out there that have been preached a false gospel. And they believe in the Lord. They believe that Jesus Christ is God. They believe that He died, that He was buried, that He rose again, that heaven's a real place, that hell's a real place. They believe in the morality of the Bible. You know, they believe the Bible, but they don't understand the gospel. You know what they're doing? They're spending their life uh, striving or trying to strive to enter into that rest. They're, they want to enter into that rest, and that can be burdensome. I mean, that's a lot of responsibility, a lot of accountability. You know, I was young when I got saved. I was 11 years old, or just about, just about right before I had turned 12. But I can't imagine growing up and being an adult and being in a false religion such as Catholicism and having a sincere heart, not hearing the gospel, and truly just desiring to go to heaven and just trying to do everything that I could and leave the be live the best life that I can. But sincere, deep down in your heart, do you know what you know? You're not good enough. You know that you're a sinner. You know that you're not keeping the laws. You know you're breaking them constantly every day. All the time. Wouldn't that be a lot of guilt on your conscience? Wouldn't that be a big burden that you're just carrying around with you constantly? All this heavy weight, just constantly. You know what you just keep going, doing? Just keep plowing that field. You just keep plowing that field and taking that horse out. and You know, you know uh, sowing seed just constantly. You're just trying as hard as you possibly can. Do you know what they need? They need somebody to come unto them and tell them, as Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that are... That are heavy laden and I will give you rest. They need somebody to come to them and tell them that Jesus did all the work. You don't need to plow the field anymore, my friend. You don't need to take the horse out anymore. Amen. You just need to put your faith in Christ and then you get to enter into His rest. He did all of the works for you. He did everything. Amen. He did everything. You know, He did the labor. He did the works. All you have to do is just put your faith in Him. Go back to Hebrews chapter number 4. Hebrews chapter number 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 4. So notice it says, 
my rest. It's his rest. We enter into his rest. We, we rest in Jesus' work, forgiven his righteousness, his perfect life. And that's a, a perfect picture of us being in his rest, right? His perfect life that he lived is taken and given to you. And you're clothed with it. You're clothed in his righteousness. That's a picture of his rest. You know what his righteousness is? All the works that he did. The works that he did and he performed all throughout his life. Jesus worked hard. Jesus worked extremely hard. And he lived a perfect, sinless, righteous life. And you know what he did? He took all of his labor and all of his work and he, and he just gave it to you. And you didn't have to do anything. And he said, you just rest and you can have this. I mean, that's glorious. Amen. You don't have to do anything. Just here, I'll do all the work. You just rest. And I'll just give it all to you. Here it is. I mean, that when you stop and just think about it, you let it you know, soak in for a minute, that's great. Amen. And it's a field. Here's the thing. You'll never plow that field. I mean, it's that feeling of just never seeing the end. It's not, it's not possible. It's an endless field that you would never be able to plow yourself. Right. You would never be able to do good enough. So you know what he did? He plowed it, and then he came back and he said, here, here's a, I already did all the works. You just, just sit there and just, you can just hold on to them and just rest. Amen. You know, that's great. Look at verse number 6. It says this, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. So he's saying, there must be some that aren't saved. That's what he's saying. There must be some that still need to enter in. That's his point. Notice how he keeps saying some. Any of you. Right? He says, we which have believed, implying what? That maybe you, some of you didn't. Implying that maybe there's some of you that are just like them. That's why he's giving this invitation of salvation because he's very skeptical of their salvation. And he's saying, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, he says, and then he goes on and says, And they to whom it was first preached entered not in. Now why did they not enter in? Because of unbelief. Now notice over and over and over again it tells you what is the requirement if you want to enter into that rest. Belief. It's not labor. It's not works. It tells you that the works were finished from the foundation of the world. It just told you that. You know, the Bible is so clear, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's saying, you know, I'll do all the work. So notice, it's because of unbelief. Verse 7, again, now watch this. He limiteth a certain day, saying. Now notice that. He limiteth. What, what was I, 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 one of the things that I mentioned in the very beginning? It was that Jesus or, or I'm sorry, the book of Hebrews is continually teaching like, hey, while the opportunity is here, while you hear his voice, while the, it's, it's, the invitation is still being extended, before it's too late, nation of Israel, before the promise has left us, any of you should seem to come short of it. He keeps over and over. What does it mean to limit it? It's saying there's a time restraint on this. You better get it while you can. You better get it before there's no hope, before it's too late, and just the whole nation of Israel, everyone has just rejected the Word of God. And that's what you see today. They have just totally rejected the Lord and rejected the Word of God, and that was what Paul was afraid of. And he's telling them, you need to believe while there's still time. He, limit, he limiteth. It says again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today. So this is the day that he's limited. This is your opportunity. Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now, what does that mean? I want you to think about that for a minute. Saying he limited, limiteth, that's limits, the same thing. He limits a certain day. He's saying like, this is your opportunity. What does that imply? That you won't have an opportunity after this. You're not going to get another opportunity. We're not going to just, you're not going to just keep getting these millions and millions of opportunities, right? That's why it says, He limiteth a certain day, saying to, in David, Today, if you will hear his voice. Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That was also quoted in chapter 3. Look at verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. Now, Jesus there is not referring to our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus there is actually referring to whom we know as Joshua of the Old Testament, who was the minister and successor of Moses, right? He was he who ministered to Moses and then, and then he followed Moses afterward uh, as far as once Moses had died, he became, you know, the leader. He was the man that was set over the congregation. So, and the way you can just understand this basically is this. It says, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward, now notice that, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. So what it's saying there is, if, if the rest, if Jesus would have given them rest, then would he not, now, now this is the important part, this is what will help you to understand it, if you, this confused you, then would he not afterward have spoken of, of another day. So it's telling you that when David offered that rest today, that that took place after when Jesus was attempting to give them rest. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? That that invitation that came from David, hey, today, that took place after Jesus was seemingly giving them rest. That's probably a good way to word it. Seemingly, Jesus was giving them rest, but then David offered them rest after that. So he's saying, if that was the real rest, or if that was the true rest, why is their rest still being offered afterwards? That's his point. Now, this is all the same context, because uh, when the children of Israel were wandering in, in the wilderness, that was with who? Moses. And that's why Moses was mentioned in chapter number 3. Chapter number 3 deals uh, mainly with the rejection of the Word of God under Moses' uh, you know, um, rule. Right? When he was ruling. Now, once they rejected the Word of God, then at that point, basically jo Joshua ended up taking over at one point. And uh, when Joshua took over... He was the one who actually led them into, you know, the promised land. He led them into the land of Canaan. That was Joshua. The name Jesus in the New Testament is just the translation from Greek to English of the name Joshua. In the Old Testament, it was Joshua. That's all that it was. From Hebrew to English, that is the same name as Jesus that we see in the New Testament. The Old Testament name Joshua is the New Testament name Jesus. And you may or may, may not have known this, but Miriam is, does anybody know? The same name as Mary. Yeah, Miriam is the same name as Mary. Exactly. There are a bunch of names like this. There's a ton of names that are like this. Um, you know, where you'll have, you know, just a slightly different pronunciation or just a, maybe just a couple of words that just make it sound different uh, than the New Testament name. So that's the same thing here. So when it says Jesus here, it's actually talking about Joshua. So did Joshua give them rest? In a, in a temporary physical way, yes. Because it was meant to be a picture of the true rest. And what he's doing right here is, it, you know, all of the children of Israel, they would have felt like, hey, this is our rest. Isn't that the way that it seemed to them? They were laboring in the wilderness. They were dying to get to the land that flowed with milk and honey. So they thought, hey, when we get to the promised land, we are going to what? This is going to be a time of rest, right? But that wasn't the true rest. That was only a picture of the heavenly Jerusalem or of just heaven over Jordan. I want you to look at the next verse, what it says now. Verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. So there's still a rest to the people of God. And what is it? So he's saying heaven. Obviously, if once they were in the land, God is still telling them, hey, you know, there, there's rest to come. Is the land, is that particular land the rest? Of course not. He's saying, hey, there's rest to come. If they're in the land, then obviously that's not the rest that God spoke of. It's, it's heaven. Heaven is the rest. Look at verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. So that's a very important verse. This is a powerful verse that teaches that we are not saved by our own works. So it says this, For he that is entered into his rest. Whose rest? That's Christ's rest. That's God's rest, right? The work that the Lord Jesus Christ did. So if we enter into His rest, then how do we enter into His rest? What did it just tell us? By faith. 
So we enter into his rest by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says this, he also hath ceased, that's past tense, from his own works. So what takes place at the moment of faith in Christ? At the moment of faith in Christ, what takes place? The Bible says you've ceased from your own works. And what is that referring to? Exactly, the works of the law. Because every man is under the old covenant before he puts his faith in Christ. At the moment that you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you enter by the blood of Christ into the new covenant. That, at that very moment. But every single person, it's very interesting with the old covenant, God makes a statement, it says, and I, he says that he makes this covenant with Israel and with those that are present, and then he says, and to as many as be afar off, saying everyone. That's his point. Every man is under the old covenant until he puts his faith in Christ, and then he is put into the new covenant. So you know what he's doing? He's working. Whether he fully understands it or not, because you know what he's going to be judged by when he dies? His works. Whether he knows that or not, he's working. He's laboring under that old covenant. That's what he's doing. He's a, he's a servant to that old covenant. Whether he understands it, whether he knows it, he's under that old covenant and he's laboring. But you know what happens at the moment that you put your faith in Christ? For your salvation, in order to enter into that rest, you just, you've ceased from your own works. You've totally ceased from your own works. You know why? Because you're resting in Jesus' work. You're resting in the, in the work that Christ did. That's why when Jesus died on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. He did all of the labor as far as the physical work that needed to be done on this earth. He had totally finished it. He died. Obviously, he went to hell. And he rose again from the dead. And we are fully trusting in what he did for us. And we're not trusting in what we have done at all. So notice that he, he has ceased from his own works and it says as God did from his. So in the same way that when God created the world in the six days, he rested on the seventh day, that is the exact same way that it works for us at the moment that we believe we enter into his rest and we no longer are, are under that bondage and carrying that burden of those six days in order to try to enter into that rest. Now, verse 11 is the verse that people will try to twist and try to you know, make it say something that it's not saying. Verse number 11, it says this. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, number one, this is what we start with. <clears throat> we start with the clear verses all throughout the Bible that teach us and tell us that salvation is by faith over and over and over again. But not only that, we see the scores of verses that we've already read tonight in Hebrews chapter number 4 that just told us, even the verse just prior, what did it just tell you? Just, just before that, the verse just prior says, For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works. What did it tell you in order to enter, in order to, to be saved or to enter into that rest? What do you have to do? What do you do? At that moment, you cease from your own work. So would it make sense for Paul to tell you, you need to work to enter into the rest? Paul just told you, and uh, this is actually an even stronger verse. Look at verse number 2. For, oh, I'm sorry, verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into rest. That's present tense. He is in rest. And what did he do to get into the rest? Believe. So how would it make sense to say that verse 11 says the labor to enter into the rest? When he just clearly told you over and over again that you believe to enter into the rest and then once you get into the rest, at that time you cease from your own works. You, why? Because it tells you that the works were finished from the foundation of the, earth, of the world. They were already done by Christ. Now, th there could be two interpretations to this. You know, number one... It could be that, and I, this is not the one that I subscribe to. This, is, this would be with the context that we're reading. It would make sense. He could be speaking in a pluralistic way, in plurality, to all the Jews. Because he says this, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. So he could be speaking to the Jews. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Now, how, how could you apply that? Well, what does, what does Paul do in order to get the Jews to enter into that rest? What does he do? 
He preaches the gospel to them. He would do works and he would preach the gospel to them. That is, preaching the gospel is a hard work and is referred to as a work all throughout the Bible. Amen. So that could be what he's referring to when he says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. One person, you know, you know the Jews preaching the gospel to the Jews. That, this is a possible interpretation to it. And then it says, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now that would be those that haven't believed. So he's saying, let us labor therefore, on, you know, for the Jews' sake, lest any man, lest there's any of the Jews that reject the word. Right? Or, here's the thing. Do you think, what, what did Paul spend his time on? What was he doing? He's going into synagogues constantly in the beginning. That's not labor. That's hard work. Constantly, what was his purpose? Because he didn't want any man to fall after that same example of unbelief. So he could be provoking or exhorting the Jews that are saved and telling them, hey, let us labor lest any man, like of the Jews, you know, falls after that same example of unbelief. That's not my interpretation of it. My interpretation is, I, that's possible, but I don't believe that. My interpretation is this, that it's a play on words. Because I believe that verse number 10 is so clear, it, it can't be any clearer. And he tells you in verse number 10, For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works. So this is those that have believed, like Paul said, do enter into rest himself. It says he ceased from his own works, right? And then he says, as God did from his. So that's a super clear statement. Extremely clear. So... When he says labor there, I believe that he is using a play on words because he's using an illustration of the six days and then the Sabbath day at the end. And I'll show you an example where he actually refers to belief as labor in the sense of using an illustration. And he's being facetious. I want you to go to John chapter number 6. John chapter number 6. John chapter number 6, and this is Jesus preaching. He's preaching to the Jews. He's actually, it's, it's interesting because in the context, he's talking about Moses. He's talking about all of that. Almost exactly the same subject. John chapter number 6. I want you to look at verse number 28. Verse number 28 says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? So notice that. I mean, pretty clear what they, how they are viewing salvation, right? You know, what shall we do? He's talking about salvation in context and then they're, they're basically asking, what works do we have to do that we could be saved? That's basically what they're asking in this context. So what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Look at Jesus' response in verse number 28. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. So in this sense, what was the work that he told them that they had to do? To believe. Now, is believing a work? Is believing a work? It is not. Believing is not a work. I'll give you a verse so you can prove that it's not. In Romans chapter number 4, it says, Now to him that worketh not, but believeth. That's Romans 4, 5. I'm sorry, not Romans 4, 4. So notice what it says. You know, to him that worketh not, but believeth. Now, if, if believing is work... You wouldn't be able to not work and believe. It would be impossible to be able to do that, right? So it clearly teaches you and tells you that working is different than believing. It's not, they're, they're, they're completely different things, right? So right here, what Jesus is doing is, they're like, what might we do that we might work the works of God? And he's like, okay, you want to do work? This is the work. Just believe on him. That's how he's answering. He's being facetious. He's being sarcastic, if you will. He's using an illustration. And furthermore... He actually uses the word labor right before this. Look at verse number 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Now notice he says, labor not for you know, the meat that perisheth. Right? He's implying like, hey, you know, do this labor. But what is the labor? It's not really labor, it's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you do have to do something. You are doing something, but it's not works, right? It's just by faith. And Jesus, of course, goes on and clarifies over and over again that it is only by belief. It is only by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, look at verse 35. 
And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So and then he, verse 36, But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. So notice he's really clear. It's only by faith. But he notice how he makes that play on words where he actually refers to belief as a labor. And what's the point? Because it fit the context perfect, perfect, perfectly. What about Hebrews chapter number 4? What's the context? It's about the labor and how we're no longer working. And what are we doing? We're entering into his rest. Right? And who did the work? He did the work. That's why he says, and that's why he uses the word labor. Go back to Hebrews chapter number 4. That's why he says, let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. As, now, here, this is why it's important. Has Paul already believed? Paul has believed. Verse number 3. For we which have believed. He's in that group that believed. Right? For we which have believed do enter into rest. Now, this is super important because this will cause you not to be able to understand this concept in your mind. I want you to picture, like it was likened unto in the previous chapter, the house of Israel. Just all of Israel, right? And divide it right down the middle. This faction believes, this faction does not believe. Just like in the wilderness with the children of Israel then, right? Paul, in verse number 3, he says this, for we, talking about those that have believed on this side within the children of Israel, for we which have believed do enter into rest. Saying we which have believed like maybe you didn't. You know, you know, some of you, any of you should seem to come short of it. That's the group over here that might not have believed. Here's your opportunity. That's why he's continually you know, offering the invitation of salvation because he believes there's some that have not believed. Then when he says it in verse number 10, this is him speaking, or I'm sorry, verse number 11. This is him speaking in general to all of the house of Israel. He's saying this, let us therefore labor like believe. Like as, as Jews, as Israelites, just in case anyone hasn't. Let us therefore labor. There, uh, I'm sorry, let us, therefore, let us labor therefore to enter in that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Just in case, lest there is anyone that has not believed. This is an invitation to them to put their faith in Christ. This is an invitation to the ones that possibly might not have. And he can't be sure whether someone has or someone hasn't. It's split right down the middle in that sense of those that have believed, so those that have not believed. And right here is where it actually shifts off of that subject of where he's offering an invitation of salvation to maybe some Jews that aren't saved. So verse number 12, really famous verse, verse number 12 says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now this is, you know, in context, this verse is extremely powerful. Because what he's saying is that the word of the Lord, the word is being preached unto you. And it's in the context of maybe you're saved, maybe you're not saved. Does, does Paul the man know for sure whether they are or whether they're not? He doesn't. But do you know who does know? God. Amen. Do you know who does know? The Word of God. Notice it says, for the Word of God is quick. What does that mean? It means it's alive. The word quick in the Bible means alive. Saying, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit. So notice how it's dividing too, right? It divides between the saved and the unsaved as well. It divides within a person's heart. It says, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner. Now notice that. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What does it mean to discern something? It means to to see something and know and understand it. That's what it means to discern something, right? That's what it means to be a discerner. So it's saying that, you know, it's discerning your thoughts and your, and the, even the intents. Not only the thought. I mean, think about that. The intent also, like the thought you're having, it's discerning the intentions of why you're having that thought. Like what you actually want to do because of that thought. 
You act, it, it, it understands your intentions, why you're doing things. You know, I've made this statement before. My pastor used to say this when, uh, you know, uh, when I, when Bible study, he used to mention this very often, you know, when he's talking about the Word of God. And he'd preach on, you know, the King James Bible very often. It was a, one of his favorite subjects. And he'd always say, you know, when you're reading the Bible, the Bible is reading you. And that can be a scary thought when you start, you know, getting into this book. If your heart's not right, you better get it right. Because, and, you know, that's why so many people will walk away with just crazy false doctrines. You know, you know, when they get into the Word of God, the Word of God cuts in there. It knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So when you, when, you know, before you read the Word of God, you know what it's a good thing to do? Is to pray to the Lord and get your heart right before you get in there. You know, and you, you can, uh, you know, right before you, you can make it a, a tradition where right before you pray... You get down on your hands and knees. I'm sorry, right before you read the Word of God, you get down on your hands and knees and you pray to the Lord. Get your heart right with God. Because that's a scary thought. That's a scary thought thinking that while you're reading the Word of God, that it is alive and it is reading you. And it understands your intentions. It understands the, all the thoughts that you had throughout the day, where, you're, where your heart is in your life. Look at verse number 13, because this is interesting. Watch what it says next. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest, look what it says, in his sight. Now, what was it talking about? The Word of God. Now, notice how it says, his sight. Almost like the Word of God is a person, right? But it's not the second person. It is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The purpose of verse 12 in context was to tell those that are that the letter is being written to, that it's addressed to, is God knows whether you're saved, whether you're unsaved. God knows whether you're believing it, whether you're rejecting it. That's why he says, you know, uh, uh, today, if you will hear his vo voice, harden not your hearts. He knows whether or not you actually believe it, whether or not you rejected it, or you're going to receive it. God understands that. And it says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. What does it mean to be manifest? Known understood, discernible. That's what it means. It's saying that he understands and knows everything about every creature. But all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What does that mean? Why would he be bringing this up in this context? This is extremely important. It's saying that you know, he knows whether you're legit or whether you're sincere about the word of God. All of the children of Israel, did a lot of them seem like they believed in the Lord but didn't? Think about that. A lot of them did. All of them in the wilderness, they seemed like they were a part of the program. They seemed like they had put their faith you know, in God and that they were trusting God to bring them into the rest. But had they? It says they, they did not believe. And that's why he's explaining right now that there's nothing, there's nothing that's, that's not manifest in his sight. Everything is manifest in his sight. And he knows all things. It's all naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So you can see him exhorting and encouraging those that believe to hold fast their profession. Verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without, without sin. So, of course, this is a great verse to teach the sinlessness of Christ. We can see that he, he was tempted in the same way that we're tempted, but he's without sin. All the same temptations as far as externally. Obviously, he didn't have the internal temptations, but externally, things were tempting him. He wasn't being tempted within his heart like he desired to do these things. Those are two, two entirely different types of temptations, right? He wasn't desiring in that sense of temptation, like, I really want to commit that sin. That's lust. That's actually a sin. What it was was what, you know, just like how Satan will tempt you to do things and will try to lure you in with something, he was tempted. And let's look at a perfect example. You actually need to, if, if you have trouble understanding something, look for an example of maybe where it took place. And what's the perfect example of Jesus being tempted? Matthew 4. And what is it? Does it look like he's kind of struggling with maybe doing it? No. He's being tempted externally. And he, and he's, he remains steadfast. 100%. He rebukes Satan, right? He's weary in the flesh. He's tired. It's hard. 
But he stands on his two feet, he rebukes Satan, and every time turns him away. Those are external temptations. But he understands what that's like. He understands you know, all of these different things, how, what it is in the flesh to be tempted. He understands that. So when we have problems in our life, we can always, of course, go to Christ knowing that he understands and he can relate to us. Look at verse number 16. It says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now that's a powerful verse. We're gonna, that's a perfect verse to end the chapter on. Just knowing that you know, problems that arise in our life, issues that we have in our life, that we can go boldly. That's a strong word. Boldly to the throne of grace. And I want you to think about this from this perspective. You know, obviously God seated on His throne in heaven. Doesn't, doesn't that sound fearful? Doesn't that sound, you know, you know, approaching the throne of God? If that doesn't scare you, you need to understand that the holiest of all, the holy of holies, that was meant to represent the throne of God. That's why the mercy seat is there and all of that. That's what that is. The cherubims are there. That's meant to look like how it looks in heaven. And what happened if somebody went through that veil and they weren't supposed to? They'd die. That's meant to show you, you know, the, the seriousness, if you will, the terrible, terribleness of approaching the throne of God. You know, how fearful that it could be approaching the throne of God because He is powerful. He's a dreadful God. He is a powerful God. He's omnipotent. You know, we, you know every, all the, the depths of God we can never wrap our mind around, right? You should fear the presence of God. Amen. Understanding His power, the wrath that He's poured out many times, His righteousness, knowing that you're standing in front of a perfect being that has no sin, has never committed sin, 100% righteous. You know, you would act like Isaiah is what you would do. You would talk about how filthy you are and how you're of, you know, of a race basically of unclean lips. You know, that's, that's how mankind acts in the presence of God. Everyone without exception. That's how man would be in the presence of God because he's fearful. But that same God tells you, those that have put their faith in him, those that are the people of God, he, he's the one that tells you. It's not even somebody else telling you. He tells you that you, that he wants you to come to his throne boldly. He wants you to approach unto his throne boldly when you have a problem or you have something that you need. He gives you guidance. It's not like when Esther had to approach the throne of Ahasuerus and what was she? She was nervous. Wasn't she? She was nervous because she didn't know how it was going to turn out. She didn't know what was going to happen. If he didn't raise up the scepter... You know, it could be off with her head, right? Obviously, the Lord is so much more powerful than Ahasuerus, a million times. You know, and she was afraid of Ahasuerus. How much more afraid should you be of the Lord in heaven? But do you think she would have been afraid if Ahasuerus would have said, every time, you know, anytime you have something you need, I want you to approach my throne boldly. You think she would have been afraid? No, she would have been confident, wouldn't she? Should have known, I know I'm going to get what I need. You know, that's, the Bible tells us that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us and He'll answer our prayers. God wants to answer your prayers. God wants to help you when you have problems in your life. And He tells you, come to my throne boldly. When you, come, when you pray to me, when you have something that you need, come to my throne boldly. What does it mean to be bold? It means to be confident. You need to come to Him confidently and boldly and pray to Him boldly because He told you to. That's why you can. You say, why? Because we have the Lord Jesus Christ as our intercessor. Because we know that, that He, he is, is the one that's praying on our behalf. That He is our mediator. That He is there for us and we have His blood covering all of our sins. God wants to answer our prayers. The Bible tells us that, that we have not because we ask not. He desires to answer our prayers and He tells us when you have something that you need, come to my throne, approach my throne, and you can do so boldly. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this night. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for, uh, for our church here, dear Lord. We thank you for all the families that were able to make it tonight, dear Lord. We ask that you bless Brother Rick, that you would help his back, dear Lord. You would uh, alleviate the pain. 
dear God, and that you would also uh, just uh, heal him, uh, if it be your will, help him to have a permanent resolution uh, to his... Uh, to his injury, dear God, we thank you for, for uh, everything that you've done for us. Just help us to be grateful for it, dear Lord. Uh, um, and uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it, dear God. Help us to grow in understanding of it, dear Lord. Uh, help us to, uh, to, to love the word of God and to love the truth. And just keep being with us and, and blessing our church. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.